Now, from a spiritual standpoint, there are three kinds of men. I'm teaching on the spiritual man. I want to show you by this teaching the pathway to accessing greater glory, greater power, and greater grace. There are three kinds of men from a spiritual standpoint that the Bible identifies. Number one, the Bible calls the first kind of man, spiritually speaking now, not just speaking anthropology, but from a spiritual standpoint. Number one, a natural man or the natural man. This is the first kind of man that the Bible identifies from a spiritual standpoint. And there are a few characteristics around this kind of man. Please look up number one. The Bible says that man is unregenerate. The meaning of that is that he's not encountered Jesus. He's not saved. Are we together now? The natural man, according to scripture, is one who has not encountered the life of Christ. He is not in union with the spirit of God. He is unregenerate. He is not saved. So every man who is not in Christ, no matter how intellectually sound, no matter how successful, no matter how in enlightened as, as far as secular enlightenment is concerned, it doesn't mean they are bad people, but by the Bible description of such people, no matter what your achievement is, no matter what your level of educational qualification is, no matter your level of exposure as an individual, once you have not encountered the God of the Bible through the process of salvation, and that's by hearing the gospel and receiving it, when that has not happened to you, the Bible calls you a natural man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. So the natural man, the Bible says, he receiveth not the things of the Spirit. Notice what he cannot receive. The Bible does not say that there's something wrong with his comprehension of things in life. The natural man can be a professor. So he's an intelligent person. Doesn't have to be a dull person. The natural man can be a multi-millionaire. The natural man can be a billionaire. The natural man can have physical things. Because those things work by laws. Are we together now? And some of those laws do not necessarily need you to be saved to understand them. God gave everybody a mind and you don't have to be saved for your mind to be activated. Your faculty of reasoning, assimilating and interpreting things can work whether you are born again or not. It is God's gift to all men once you are alive. Even lower animals have their faculties of perception and reasoning at a level activated already. So they have instincts. They have the ability to make judgment within their limited understanding. Are we together now? So when the Bible talks about a natural man, he's not talking about a failure. This is a spiritual description. Because for most people, we think natural people are necessarily failures. No. They are not failures at all. Some of the natural people we have on earth today are those we consider the most successful people from a secular standpoint. So when the Bible talks about a natural man, he's not at all speaking in terms of physical things. So that you have someone who has a car, a great job, maybe a, a great family. The word natural is only with respect to his encountering Jesus, encountering the Holy Spirit. Are we learning already? Because there are many people who will think because life is working well for them. They have money, good education, good investments, great children, great family. They'll say, I mean, what, what more do I need? For such people, if you don't give them this orientation, when you are talking about the natural man, they think you are talking about a poor person who is a failure, who is a needy, who is hoping that God will help him. The natural man is not just talking about the unbeliever in the village who does not have a house, does not have a car, is broke. Uh -uh. When the Bible talks about the natural man, he's speaking a spiritual language that anyone who does not yet have his organs of interaction with the realm of the spirit and the things of God, as far as that is concerned, he's a natural man. Give it to us now. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. I'm describing for you first and foremost the three kinds of men from a spiritual standpoint so that the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him notice why he doesn't receive them 
They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because it will require a faculty that is not yet activated in his life. Do you know, please look up, as simple as spiritual things are that you receive with all your heart, it is because something has been activated within your spirit man that gives you an appreciation for things like prayer, an appreciation for things like fasting. Are we together? An appreciation for things like coming to church, loving the Lord, honor to priesthood, you know, loving the word of God. These things are natural to you because you have left that realm of the natural man. But to one who is not saved, remember your former self. For some of you, it was foolishness to you. If you heard someone pray in tongues, you say, how can such an intelligent adult act like this? Someone quoting scripture or speaking in the name of Jesus, I am blessed. And you tell the person, please use your brain. Now you are this kind of person in the Bible or you were this kind of person the Bible is talking about now. That it is foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Are we learning now? So there is a natural man, the Bible says, anyone who has not encountered Christ, anyone who cannot be fruitful towards spiritual understanding is a natural man. Very quickly, the second kind of man that the Bible identifies is called the carnal man. The carnal man. Who is the carnal man? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, the carnal man is a believer he's saved he's encountered jesus christ but that individual is still a slave to the impulses of the flesh he's not contended for growth the word carnal means sensual a slave to the flesh and i brethren could not speak unto you as spiritual paul says but as unto carnal even as unto babes in christ so he's saying, I came to you hoping that I will speak. Do you know what that means? That means Paul did not speak to everybody at the same level. The first thing he did was to discern which of these three men. If you were a natural man, then there was a way Paul spoke to you. If you were a carnal person, there was a way Paul spoke to you. And this is so true. As a man of God, it's important for you to obtain grace from God and discern the spiritual state of the people that you are speaking to so that you do not waste truth and it falls upon lives that do not even have an appreciation nor the faculty to understand what you are saying are we together there are times that when you discern that these people are largely unregenerate usually your context there becomes to present jesus to them like in a crusade ground there are certain things if you are teaching on a crusade ground, you will see people shouting, preach, preacher, but believe me based on the truth of scripture. They don't understand what you are saying. And because humans don't easily admit that they are not getting it. They feel embarrassed. They don't, they don't want to look stupid that they are not understanding you. They tell you, I'm, I'm really getting you, but they are not getting anything because spiritual things is not just about concentration. It's about your organs of perception being activated. No matter how focused you are, if that miracle of understanding has not happened to you, you will hear a lot of spiritual things. Some will make sense, some will not make sense. The carnal man. Are we learning now? Who is the carnal man? The carnal man is one who is carnally minded. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. For to be carnally minded, this is another description of the carnal man. The carnal man is one who is carnally minded. The word carnal means sensual of the flesh, of the flesh. To be carnally minded is a pathway that leads to death. This is what Paul is teaching us. To be carnally minded is a pathway that leads to death. But to be spiritually minded is a pathway that leads to life and peace do you get what he's saying now he's saying that carnality to be carnally minded is like following a road following a route that the end of that journey is death death there does not just mean cessation of living it is a description of a kind of state to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded he says is life and peace so one who is carnally minded is usually of the flesh under the victim the the a slave to the impulses of the flesh 
disobedience to the word of God. Are we together now? Always, always in argument with spiritual things, even though they are saved. They are not malleable to receive the word of God that is able to transform them. They have not experienced the washing of the water by the word. They've not contended for transformation. And let me tell you the truth. It is a dangerous thing when carnal people become leaders in the house of God. Because you see, at that point, that ministry or that church or that spiritual organization will be in trouble. One of the, 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 the troubles that they will go into is that they cannot receive what God wants them to do. Because you see, when you are dealing with spiritual things, it's not like you do business and like you run secular organizations. You have to depend on the impulses of the spirit. And in many regards, there will be foolishness to you at the moment. It is later you see the hidden wisdom in that instruction. It's important that those who serve God's word, it's important that those who occupy positions of leadership in church be people who are void of carnal mindedness that they are spiritual people so we have the natural man we have the carnal man number three and this is where we will we'll dwell a bit tonight we have what the bible calls the spiritual man the spiritual man the spiritual man hallelujah who is this kind of man that the bible calls the spiritual man He's one who is saved. You have to be saved. Number two, transformed. The spiritual man is one who has submitted himself to be transformed by the word. Who is a spiritual man? One who is saved. One who has submitted himself or herself to transformation by the word of God. Number three, the spiritual man is one who has become spiritually minded. Romans 8 and 6, we considered that earlier. Spiritually minded. A spiritual man is one who is spiritually minded. A spiritual man is one who is obedient to the word of God. Now, I'll be sharing with you a few of these features. We'll be looking at it in details. But just to contrast for you these three kinds of men. That in every congregation, in every community, in every nation, in fact, in every spiritual family, like there are various kinds of vessels, there are these three kinds of men. Because everywhere men are gathered unto the Lord, the Lord himself adds daily as many as should be saved. He expects them to be saved as they come. But until they are saved, they are not yet saved. So we have the natural man, we have the carnal man, we have the spiritual man. I hate to tell you this, but in this beautiful congregation tonight and across the many who are following around the world, we have these three kinds of people. They are those who have never met Jesus. Perhaps they are even following from other religions, other faith, other practices. They are just sympathetic to the idea of spirituality. Or they like the idea of koinonia or joshua selman or they're just good people really like the rich young ruler the rich young ruler was successful by every standard but he was still a natural man he came to jesus and he said good master what must i do to inherit eternal life and he said wow you call me good no man is good except god so the fact that you have called me good that means you discern that i'm not all human you see that now and then he began to give him all the requirements and the man left sad because he had great possessions, the Bible said. What's the one thing holding you back from living the life God has called you to? I bet it's fear. Fear that whispers, you're not enough, you can't do it, you'll fail. But what if I told you, God never intended for you to live in fear? In fact, he has given you everything you need to overcome it. Today, we're going to talk about how to break free from the chains of fear and walk in the boldness that God has already placed inside of you. And it all starts with one thing, faith. Let's dive in. Fear is something we all face. It can be paralyzing, overwhelming, and even make us doubt God's promises. But here's what we need to understand. 
fear is not from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let that sink in for a moment. Fear is not your identity. Power, love, and a sound mind are. Fear doesn't get the final say in your life. God's power does. I know some of you are watching this right now feeling like fear has gripped every area of your life. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of the unknown. But here's the good news. Jesus is greater than your fear. When you feel anxious or afraid, you're not meant to carry that weight alone. In fact, Jesus invites us in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Fear can weigh you down. It can make you feel like you're carrying a burden too heavy to bear. But God is saying, come to me. Give that fear to me and I'll give you peace. When you put your trust in God, you start to realize that he's bigger than your fears. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 reminds us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is literally promising that you don't have to do it alone. He's holding you up, even when the fear feels overwhelming. What if, instead of focusing on your fears, you started focusing on God's promises? Practical Steps to Overcome Fear So, how do we practically overcome fear in our daily lives? Here are three key steps. Number one, meditate on God's Word. The Bible is full of promises that combat fear. One of my favorites is Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Read scriptures like this daily, remind yourself of God's truth, and fear will lose its grip on your heart. Number two, pray boldly. Prayer is not just asking God for things, it's an exchange. When you come to God in prayer, give him your fear and receive his peace. Philippians chapter four verses six to seven tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number three, take action in faith. Fear tries to freeze you in place, but faith moves you forward. Whatever God is calling you to do, do it despite the fear. That's where real courage comes from. Not the absence of fear, but moving forward, through it with the strength of God by your side. In conclusion, listen, I don't know what fears you're facing right now, but I do know this. God has already given you the power to overcome them. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You can live boldly, confidently, and courageously because God is with you. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So, don't let fear have the final word in your life. Instead, let faith rise up. Let God's promises lead the way. If this message has touched you, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone who needs to hear it. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell for more content that will strengthen your walk with Christ. Let's break free from fear together.